everyone for joining us. Um, hopefully we get a few more participants, but um, we're happy with who we have. And um, this is the Greenbelt Black History and Culture Committee. Um, this is our second um, business panel. This is entitled Maintaining Your Business in Greenbelt, Reinvesting in Black and Brown Communities and Promoting Generational Wealth. Um, I'm gonna read a preamble. This is the Greenbelt Black History and Cultural Committee has organized a series of programs for this year's Black History Month. Each year, the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, founded by Carter G. Woodson, the creator of Black History Month, selects a theme. And this year is Black Health and Wellness, or as we prefer, by body, mind, and money. Our committee added wealth and finance because health and wellness intersect with financial ability. So we're saying green belt history, I'm sorry, black history is celebrated 365 days a year and February is our anniversary. So today we have four panelists. We have Janine Clark, the owner and principal of the law firm of Janine Clark. Lori Sales, the owner, president and CEO of Civility Management Solutions and Theo Milford, professional engineer, senior vice president of Conquest Solutions, and Sharice Liggins, Office of Greenbelt Economic Development Coordinator. Um, I am Gail Critchlow, the moderator, representing the Greenbelt Black History and Culture Committee. So we're gonna ask a few questions and invite the panelists to share your experience and expertise as an African-American small business owner. So we're gonna rotate the panelists and the questions um, as we go. And, but feel free to you know, add to your bios or add additional information, but we're trying to get through all the questions. So I'm gonna start with the first question. Um, can you share your journey from startup to growing and sustaining your business? Ms. Clark. Oh, that's a, a loaded question, but I will try my best. Um, so I started out uh, when I went to law school, I had decided that I was going to be a prosecutor. And when I graduated from law school, um, you know, I was trying to get a job as a prosecutor in the DC area and I was unsuccessful. A friend of mine had a law practice that he had started and he asked me to come in and start picking up cases. And so that's how my practice started. Um, he eventually left the, the office space and I was there for, by myself, um, but I had gotten a really good foundation of the types of cases that I thought I would be interested in having come in and the ones that I thought that I would be really good at in representing my clients. So what started out as a criminal practice ended up being a family law and now a state planning practice. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, so, you know, I guess my advice would be never say never, um, never limit yourself to one particular area. What you will find is your space and, and uh, your purpose will make room for you and just be open, you know, when those changes come, because you never know. Um, and so that's kind of how it started. And I, my office started in Capitol Heights, and then I moved to Lanham. And six years ago, I moved to Greenbelt. Um, and, you know, I, I'll obviously let the other panelists talk about, you know, their thoughts on this particular question. But, you know, what I found is that I'm working harder now than I first started. <laughs> you know, I thought I was going to be at retirement age and, you know, it's like not so. <laughs> so, you know, just my mindset about the business of running my practice versus just being this attorney, right? And knowing the law and all of that has really taken a major shift over the years. Because at the end of the day, you know, you could be the best attorney, the best doctor, the best accountant, 
But if you don't have that business savvy and you don't understand the basics and you don't have some principles and core values and things like that in place, I would say that your business is destined to fail. So I really have in the last, I would say five to six years, really focused on um, developing where I wanted the practice to go, what clientele I wanted to service specifically, and then how I was going to market to that particular clientele. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, it did. It is when do, one door closes, another opens. Absolutely. You got to be flexible. So. Yes. Miss <laughs> Sales, can you um, share with us? Should I repeat the question? Or? Um, you how, the question? What, sure. Can you share your journey from startup to growing and sustaining your business? Okay. Um, well, I guess the journey would be that always being an entrepreneur, uh, finding government contracting by a total accident uh, because someone gave me a job overseeing a contract inside the government. And I got to read away. I'm like, oh, wow, there's people that's in the government that's not federal employees. And so once I realized that, you know, I began to enjoy that whole environment of supporting the federal government as a civilian per se. Uh, and I served in the Marine Corps for 10 years, so that's why I can kind of use those terms. It's a difference. I don't know when you don't have a GS title, the rules are different for you than when you're a contractor. And then interestingly, someone that I used to work out in one of my little entrepreneurial things, I have a boot camp program. She was a present CEO of one of these companies and she was growing. I think she was about 17 million at that point, much younger than me. And I'm thinking, wow. You know, and so she asked me to join her team and I did. And at that time, that's when I began to research and investigate being a business owner in the government contracting space. I said, this is where the wealth transfer takes place. Um, and so I joined her team. Ultimately, I ended up managing about 128 people, about 11.5 million in revenue uh, for that particular company. And I began the journey while I was there with her because I let her know what I was gonna do. I began to go and take training sessions at the Procurement Technical Assistance Centers. I got myself a SCORE mentor. Uh, uh, started taking sessions there because as I just heard uh, uh, Ms. Clark talk about, you know, it's important that you get yourself some foundation. You know, you just can't jump out there and say, I'm gonna start a business. And the government contracting has different rules and regulations to how they function over any other type of business that exists in this country. Right. Um, so I did a lot of training. So for the first four and a half years or so, it was really about beating the pavement, being introduced as president CEO, civility management solutions, and you know, letting people get to know me and, and getting my training. And that I know that sound foundation is how come we've had a, a continuous increase, even though we're nowhere near where I plan on going. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, hitting the 5,000 list, you know, twice now and to have the continuous growth because I've, I did the footwork at the beginning to have the understanding right. of the work field that I'm in, as well as building the relationships that I need to have so I can call upon those people as I need them. Right. You mentioned um, relationships, um, the foundation, building, right, all key, not just an idea. <laughs> right, right, right. That was great. Okay, we have a couple of questions, so I'm trying to keep going. Um, can you share how you identified and access funding for the growth of your business, both traditional and non-traditional? I'm going to start with Ms. Sales. The growth of the business. Well, I initially started by just dumping money myself into a checking account. I, admit I started a business account out the gate. I started building business credit out the gate by just getting a Staples card, a gas card, because business credit, personal credit, two different things. Um, so I, that's how I started Civility. And then when some money started coming through from some revenue of doing either some prime work for a simplified acquisition, small contract with the government, or through a subcontract, uh, then I began to have to need money to pay people. And initially my partner, uh, that was the prime of the subcontract helped fund. So I kind of like the money rotated between the two of us uh, where he couldn't give me a loan, but we allowed the rotation of the money. And of course he always took his, his part before I got my payout. But because I built that business credit and because I built those relationships at the credit union, 
and the banks I'm affiliated with, then when I really needed to get money, I was able to go into some banks and some other factoring uh, capacities through relationships to get what I needed so I can grow my company. Wow. Okay. Did you use any non-traditional? I mean, nowadays they have the kickstart and some other things, you know, yeah. mostly like, did you and use? high interest rates. Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, uh, QuickBooks had a way to get some money. I did that. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about Kickstarter, but I'm familiar with that. I don't even remember, but because I want to not remember, right? But mm -hmm. you must take the sacrifice of not having much money at the beginning and paying high interest rates because you are a startup. And mm -hmm. anybody giving you money, you should take it. Okay. All right. Um... Mr. Milford, would you like to comment on traditional and non-traditional funding? No, I appreciate the opportunity. Again, I'm speaking here on behalf of uh, Ian Malera, our president. I'm senior vice president with Conquest Solutions. Um, just a little background. I think one of the, the things that we've grown to see is the importance of lines of credit in the business. Um, it limits the use of your own personal funding. But when the company first started, just like Ms. Sales said, um, you know, a lot of personal credit, personal guaranteeing was on the line to get things moving. Um, but over time, as, as Ms. Sales also said, developing the relationship with the lenders and the banks, we, we kind of established a relationship with one particular large bank. I do recommend also speaking to local banks because they're typically more small business friendly. Um, and I'll, I'll give a case in point is recently we went out to shop for a line of credit increase and we were with one of the large banks um, and they had limited us only to 250,000. Uh, we went out to a local bank and they were able to, to give us a 700,000 line of credit, right? And so then the large bank said, hey, we can match it and give you a 700,000. <laughs> so it is very important for us to, mm -hmm. you know, we, we were toying with making a move to a small bank only because we needed that line of credit in order to take on the work that we were um, coming into. However, um, the large banks typically are going to not want to lose a good small business customer because that's that's an aspect of their business that they get funding to actually um, increase. And so when you play that angle, which is completely OK to do in the business world, um, you can leverage um, the benefit of your relationships to be able to get what you need. So yeah, we, we, we haven't done a lot of the Kickstarter type programs. We had um, in the COVID era, you know, got some grants and that kind of stuff, but um, essentially leveraging lines of credit um, has been a very efficient uh, tool that we've used to grow. And relationships. And relationships, <laughs> and yes. Relationships. Right. Um, Ms. Clark, have you utilized different funding streams? So I, I would say that I pretty much, um, agree with you know the other speakers Ms. Sales and Mr. Milford um, about how you would go about first of course starting with your own personal lines of credit so important to have good credit personally when you're starting a business but what I've also found is for me um, we do use um, PayPal as one of our payment resources for our clients and <clears throat> I've been with PayPal for I, I can't even remember how many years, but early on when I started my business, I got a PayPal card that I was very, con very um, deliberate about what I used it for. Right. Um, and so over time, they contacted me and said, oh, by the way, we have what's called a working capital loan. And basically it's a loan that they they will look at your sales over you know, a certain period of time and they'll say you're eligible for this amount of money. And then the way that it's paid back is through your sales. So they'll either take 10% or 15% or 20% um, based upon the amount that you uh, borrow. And then, you know, so you don't necessarily see it because it go comes out of your sales and you don't feel like you're making an actual payment, even though you are. And then if you do that successfully over time, the next time you go back, to request another working capital loan, you know, you're now eligible for a higher amount. So I found that that's, an, that's a very easy and kind of, you know, they don't require a credit check or anything like that. They're just basically using your relationship with them as a basis for how they're going to determine how much that you're eligible to borrow. So I found that to be a, I guess a, a non-traditional form 
um, but one that I found to be really effective. Well, they're monitoring your sales as well. Absolutely. And give advice, I assume. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, with any of um, these lenders and, and um, kind of business products out there, everyone's trying to get a piece of the small business pie. So, you know, they're, they're now doing advice, you know, they're now opening different avenues to you for investing. And, you know, now they're doing all different sorts of things that they want to try to keep that small business money coming in. Um, so, yeah, so it's not just that working capital loan, but they're now making other business products available to small business owners as well. Okay. Okay, next question. <laughs> What barriers have you encountered to sustaining your business pre-pandemic and beyond? Um, what, what or who helped you persevere? Uh, Mr. Wolf, Mr. Wilford. Wilford, I, I could take that. I, I would say um, one of the barriers that I think a lot of small businesses are plagued with, and we were there a couple of years ago, is the need to desire to do everything yourself. Um, and not necessarily release the reins to, to other people that you can trust. Uh, what we found was in the first few years of our company, again, we're an engineering consulting and construction firm. And our, our president is a working president, even to this day, he loves the field um, and he enjoys being an engineer. Um, and, and so for a long time, he had the burden of being an engineer, developing work, selling the company, as well as doing billing, as well as doing project management. And over time, it became more of a burden than a blessing to own your own business. And so what, what, what happened was a trigger went off a couple of years ago when his mentor started encouraging him to bring on people on the team that would help him to release some of those roles and responsibilities and then empower them and trust them to be able to, to manage the company in his absence while he was continuing to develop work and, um, and, and engineer. And so where we sit now post pandemic, and I think the blessing of the pandemic was prior to that, we were a company focused on, well, you have to be at the office in order to be uh, uh, efficient. <laughs> we need to see you every day. Otherwise we don't trust that you're gonna be working. And the pandemic taught us that we actually have the right people on the bus. And it helped us to shell the people off that were not necessarily um, you know, with us completely and essentially slacked off essentially while they had time to be remote. And so now where we are is we're stronger with a much more what I would say humane policy on our human resources because we have flexibility now. We know that we can trust our people. We've empowered our people to be able to work remotely as they do in the office. And so essentially now that we're surrounded by a team, um, he's able to, to take the weight off. He's able to really enjoy his company while we're all in, in, in the background working and pushing the, the, the wheels across, you know, pushing them forward. Mm -hmm. Um, on all aspects, financial, project management, and the likes. So it's really, I think, what we learned was, um, you know, getting the right people on the bus and, and trusting them and then allowing them the opportunity to lead is ultimately going to give you um, greater results in your company. We grew three times our size in the pandemic simply because of <laughs> fundamental shifts um, in our management methodology. So some great team building then, finding the right people. Finding the right people. It's hard now, very hard now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ms. Clark, do you have employees? I do. Um, so as, as I had said before, I had done kind of a, a reboot of my practice and where I, I thought my focus would be. Um, unfortunately, that made me make some well, it's fortunate for me, but unfortunately for some of my past employees, that meant I had to let them go um, because they did not have the vision, right? Um, but also I needed to make my vision clearer as well. So what I've done is I've done a complete revamp of hiring. Um, and so I'm starting, I started completely over. Um, and so now, I have one individual and her sole purpose is customer service. She doesn't do documents. She doesn't type letters. Her whole goal is to make sure that anyone that calls my office, and I see some people in here that hopefully would be able to, to say that this is true, um, but she basically, her whole job is to make sure 
that the experience they have in calling our office in reaching out to our office is different from say your typical law firm. Um, we want our clients, our potential clients to feel like number one, that we care, we do, um, that we hear what their issue is. And number three, that we're gonna make sure that we handle it in the best way that we can. So, um, and we've gotten great feedback from that. Um, I've had comments, well, you know, I've never been in a law office like this before. I've never been treated like that before. And that's what we wanna do. We always wanna push the envelope. Yes, we provide legal services, but customer service has to be our focus. Um, what I also learned during this kind of reboot for myself was how important marketing is. Um, and again, you could be the best attorney on the planet, but if you're not marketing and don't have a focus as to who your target group is or the target that you're trying to market to or the the individual that you think would be best for your practice, then you're kind of just spin, spinning your wheels. So my next, I'm in the next phase of hiring a marketing assistant. And then um, just to kind of show you the progression and the importance of how I think things are supposed to be. So it's the customer service person first, marketing second, and then I'm gonna hire a legal assistant. Um, so, because I feel like those other two things are important. So yes, we do have employees, but you know, um, it's really important that they understand our core values. They understand, you know, that we're trying to be different, that we're going to be different and they have to, you know, understand those principles and they have to be willing to, you know, be able to express those. I give, you know, my employees a lot of latitude. They too can work remotely. Um, and I, my whole, my whole uh, comment or my whole focus is, is the work done? And if the work is done, you could take a half a day, you could take a day, but the work has to be done and it has to be done in a certain way. And I found that me refocusing has, has made my, my practice more profitable because our focus is, is on customer service as opposed to just, you know, doing it to make money, so. And the money has come, so <laughs> also. Um, Ms. Sales, I'm gonna change the question a little bit in terms of barriers. Externally, do you experience barriers as a small business or as a black owned business? And when you are approaching, um, not necessarily just government agencies or um, commercial, if you're doing commercial work, are you experienced barriers there, maybe with banking, um, hiring, externally? I mean, we, yes, we, we're building the company as we've heard, but externally, what are you experiencing, if anything? Um, well, racism is real. Um, gender parity is real. And as much as I can be excited about all these women starting businesses and woo woo, Yay, yay. Oh my God, they broke. Okay. Um, I have uh, some data from 2016. I've gotten some recent data, but this is what I carried with me. Um, and I still have it in my case. I pulled it out tonight in case I wanted to pull it up. My back here it is. And 2016 was around the time that we were going through an election. And I can tell you, ma'am, that it lists all different type of minorities. Um, you know, it has uh, every category of a woman. You can think about Filipino, Vietnamese, you know, they have white, they have Asian, Indian. I mean, it's just like 15 rows of them. But unfortunately, when they get over to the column that I have to look at, that has average receipts. African-Americans are at the very bottom. And not just at the very bottom. Annual revenue was like $27,000 nationally. And right up from that was Puerto Rican. And it was about a 50% increase from the 27,000 for the African-American women that are in business in this country. And so it was a rude awakening for me. Um, and uh, I mean, I know a lot of them is because they're solopreneurs as you were asking Ms. Ms. Clark, whether or not does she have an employee? And part of that is that mindset of not wanting employees. Getting into government contracting and the desire of knowing it's the wealth transfer, 
you know, I have a huge heart for people. I was a Marine, so I'm very team oriented. I ain't got no problem with delegating and pulling the team together. I, like, like, like Mr. Uh, Conquest, uh, the President CEO, he, he took him a while. I, I ain't got no problem with that. You know, I, I know how to put leadership on you because that's how I was trained as a young adult and the importance of leadership. So I don't care what position you got in my office, you're a leader. But I have predominantly African-Americans in my offices. But I can tell you that I know what it is to be out at networking events specifically veteran networking events where it's predominantly white male. And I've been asked about the Coke and the Pepsi product. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't work here. I'm, my name is Lori Sale. I'm president and CEO of Civility Management Solutions. But my presence amongst that crowd, I was the ideal person for them to ask about what's going on in this building as if I worked there. And it happened more than once, you know? And so I've had some reality checks about that. Uh, the sexism part about being a woman, I mean, is very real. I know what it is to actually be a, a, an officer on a committee. I've been in front of the Hill four times speaking on behalf of women, and black, and service disabled veterans, and what we need out here to survive in this government contract. And one day I'm sitting with my comrades of, you know, that are fighters, advocates on this part. And that guy outright said something to me that floored me during the season of Trump dealing with uh, um, having a stripper, right? I think uh, uh, whatever, I can't get the right term out. But bottom line, he said, oh, porn star. That was it. He's like, oh, Lori, how you doing? The last time I seen you was on the porn site. I said, excuse me? And, and I'm at the head of the table with a lot of people out there. And there's a couple of African-American women here looking at me. See, if I would have reacted a way that I could have reacted, especially because I served in the Marine Corps, I'm from the streets of Chicago, <laughs> I would have been called a mad black woman. But I had to handle that very delicately, very sophisticated. I went to the restroom, I got it all out, and I came back, and I got really close in his ear and said, don't you ever say nothing like that to another woman again. Oh, Lord, you know I'm joking around. I said, no, I'm a black woman with money. I will sue you and take everything you got. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? And I smiled at him and I sat myself down and I went ahead and had that meeting. So yes, it is very real. I'm not talking about a long time ago. <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, pre-COVID where we were all gathering that place. And so it's very real. Uh, uh, I've accepted it as part of the journey. And if you don't, then you're more doomed than you thought you were uh, uh, in getting started to get it going. You have to accept the fact that it is what it is, but you have to help educate people to get them on the other side of it, you know, without right. being rude or being nasty, but yet being very honest, because I am serious about that. I will take him to jail if he come out of his mouth and give me another sexual comment. It's called sexual harassment. And I'm, I got an attorney. <laughs> it's, about so, it's still the perceptions. It's exactly, exactly. Right. You know, so many, we just smile at all. He, ha, ha. It's not funny. And we mm -hmm. need to make sure that they understand this is not funny. This is not a joke. Because if I say something to you that's out of order, you know, you would think, again, I'm the mad black woman. No, no, I'm just checking you, you know, so be able to take what you give. But we have to do it as women. We have to do it in a way that it gets received. He just say now when he see me, he barely won't speak. I'm like, yeah, hey, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Ms. Sales, you have some names, some labels in your bio that I was hoping you could talk about. You talk about a hub zone, you talk about a woman-owned small business, service disabled, veteran-owned small business. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, within the uh, it's, it's MBEs and things like that, women-owned, we banks exist in the commercial space. But when you're dealing with the federal government, uh, the federal government have women-owned small business. They have economically disadvantaged women-owned small business, totally two different categories that set-asides are created for you to actually bid on those opportunities. So now at least who you're competing with are other women-owned businesses. Then they have the service-disabled, veteran-owned small business as well. And so these set-asides, which I'm also part of the 8A, allow the 
federal government to share some of the trillions of dollars that they have with small business owners, including HubZone. I am actually in a HubZone office in Greenbelt, Maryland, right along this ship that I'm on here in Edmonton. We are not HubZone. I got a lot of six-figure earners on my payroll uh, uh, that work on contracts. But if we got 35% of our employees that were at a certain level of, uh, of their salaries and lived in this area, that throughout the country, don't have to just live in this area, throughout the country, then you can qualify for what they call uh, the hub zone, which is historically underutilized business zone. And they're throughout the country. So those certifications add value to you uh, with being part of the uh, federal government. But like we like to say, it's a tool in the toolkit. It's a vehicle to be used, but it does not guarantee you any work. And that's mm -hmm. the confusion for me. It does not guarantee any work. You still got to get out there and sell. Right. Okay. But I would think that is um, a help. It's a, it's a, it's a stepping stone, um, a little closer to the door. So, well, it's a tool and a toolkit. Okay. So let me kind of give you a little bit more without taking up too much time is that even though the opportunity is set there for women on small businesses, you still need to have the past performance to compete. You still right. need to come in at a rate that you can win. And if you are not with any federal government contracts, that means what? You have no past performance right out the gate. Mm -hmm. So even though you're a woman owned small business, you got this certification, or you're an 8 a company because you're black and you got the certification, it does not mean that the government is going to look at you because you're still so new that past performance is what's golden in the space that I'm in, not the certification. Okay, I was just trying to get those buzzwords out there so people know that there are some other avenues to um, get started, <laughs> or not to get started, but to move forward. So um, another question, how have you utilized business networks and associations and government resources to sustain and grow your business? Um, Ms. Clark. Ooh, so I think definitely, um, the associations, right? Um, when I started, and some of those associations you have to create yourself. <laughs> so when I started, I was I had a business card, and I handed that business card out to everyone. If I had a conversation with you in Safeway, the Safeway line, and somehow that conversation turned into what do you do for a living? I had a card. <laughs> so, you know, you create those relationships first because that person may not have needed an attorney, but more than likely they know somebody that 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 does. So that that was very important to me to start off that way. Um, associations now, you know, for attorneys, we have every county, um, every state, every uh, discipline has some kind of an association. So it's always good to make contacts in those associations early on. Um, and by that, I mean right out of law school or while you're in law school, um, because as long as, you know, everyone's trying to help each other. I think one of the big misnomers sometimes is that the pie is one big piece and that we can't divide that pie up so that everybody can have an opportunity, right? Um, the pie is big enough that we all can eat, but we have to be willing to, you know, not think that if I help this person out, then that means that I don't get something, right? I'm a firm believer in the more people you help, the more people that, the more of that blessing will be come back to you in some way, shape or form. It doesn't necessarily have to be monetary. Um, so I'm always, you know, to the extent that I can be always out, um, you know, I have started focusing more on the Greenbelt community. Um, I joined the board of the Greenbelt Museum. Now, I'm not necessarily a quote unquote fundraiser. Do I have some fundraising experience? Absolutely. But that's a way of me, you know, in, putting myself in a niche that maybe I didn't think about before. It's a way of me giving back to the Greenbelt community that has been very good to me. And so 
you know, it, it, it's not just all legal, right? It's putting yourself in places to meet people and to expand your network of people. So yes, you know, you look at the associations that are connected to whatever your particular job is or your occupation is or your work is, but you also want to expand past that because again, you know, if we're not helping our community, if we're not, you know, being a face of our community, then, then what am I here for? So I would definitely say yes, you know, all those professional associations and things like that, but create associations as well. And when opportunities come, don't look past it, look at, at it as another app, uh, another opportunity, another association that you could generate from that. Okay, Mr. Milford. Yeah, no, I think Ms. Clark touched on quite a bit of it. I do think um, <clears throat> one of our, our greatest tools, as Ms. Clark mentioned earlier, was to is to utilize our business cards as a means of creating, creating the association. Um, we, we found that, again, if somebody never goes to our website or they never actually end up having a capabilities briefing, but we've left a business card with them that pretty much gives them intel on who we are then ultimately, whether they call us now, they call us later, we've left something that they can use as a tool to remind them of who we are, right? Now, beyond that, um, as Clark touched on, um, getting uh, you know, involved in local community even more. And I will say that that's one of the things that we've really started um, to, to consider even more now than we were in the beginning. When we first started, we were strictly a federal contractor, right? And even though we were based in Greenbelt, Greenbelt was for us a, a very centralized, perfectly placed hub for everything supporting DC going up to Baltimore. It's still to me one of the best locations to ever own a, a business, right? Um, but in pandemic, we found that there was an opportunity for us to be able to, to reach out to the business owners in Greenbelt and to see how we could let them know how we can help. And that's one of the questions we like to ask is, is to say, hey, would you mind allowing us an opportunity to have a conversation about how we can help? We can help you, you know, save money on your net operating income every year by doing this and, and reducing your utility spend by making these small adjustments. And yes, surely some have taken upon um, taken us up to, to, to have that conversation. But beyond that, our, our focus has been let's provide value. And then that value essentially speaks for itself. So we're very big on seeds to trees. We're not out here, we, you know, we've done 29 million in five years, but we'll take the $5,000 contract just the same. And the reason is, is because what we found is when we went and did such a great job through those relationships and through those associations of executing with, um, with such excellence on those small jobs, those same customers would then pretty much pass our information on to their, their clients and to their friends. And so we, we cannot negate that our work speaks for itself. And I think one of the things that we have to remember, regardless of our disadvantaged classification, is that we are not our disadvantaged classification. Our disadvantaged classification, as Ms. Sales said, is a tool. But who we are is the value we bring to the marketplace. And we could do that through local associations or through being authentically who we are as companies, focusing on integrity, focuses on innovation, focusing on inclusion, and letting that tell the story of our own association so that when people hear our names, they honestly will say, that's a company, that's a small business you need to work with. Someone posed a question in the chat that I'd like to share with all of you, with each of you, and maybe Ms. Sales can start. Um, do you have any associate, association to a Black Greek fraternity or sorority? If so, how has that network assisted you? Uh, my answer would be no, but I'm a United States Marine, so Marine. we have our own clique. <laughs> and let me be clear, they ain't different than every other branch of the military. <laughs> <laughs> but it has been beneficial to be a veteran, finally. Um, I lived many years as a veteran and didn't have no regards for it. It's just something I used to do. But now, you know, there are a lot of things that's out there that's veteran friendly that are very real. And so I do tap into much of that and I'm very involved with giving back to my community. Okay. Ms. Clark? So yes, I am a member of the D9. Um, I am a proud member of the D9, I should say. <laughs> 
from undergrad. Um, I will tell you that our colors are pink and green. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's see, we have a vice president who I believe is also a member of our sorority. Um, but to answer your question, yes. So, you know, you create so many relationships within your chapter, within your region, and then, you know, on an international scale. And, but I think, you know, they have to see you as a person first, right? Um, because if, if you're not approachable, if you're not, if you don't have a nice personality, regardless of whether you're sorority sisters or not, they're not going to want to do business with you. The other thing I think is really important is they get the same level of service that you would give to anyone else, right? And again, you know, if, if, if you have a particular idea of how you want, like I was talking about earlier about customer service, they should get that and more because news travels fast and they may not, I can never promise what's gonna happen in a particular case. I can't, particularly if it's, if it's a trial, it's in front of a judge, so in front of a jury. What I can promise is that we're gonna do the best job that we can. And so if that understanding is made up front, then if they don't get the result that they want, they always can fall back, but she honored her word when she said, I was always going to be able to get in contact with her. She was going to explain, you know, the process. I always got my questions answered. Those basic things that I promise up front, as long as that person sees that you honored your word, then that carries over to goodwill with her, but it also carries over to goodwill that she'll share, you know, among other members of our sorority. But yes, I have definitely leveraged that. Um, and then it goes outside because just because you're in a sorority doesn't mean that you don't know other people, right? And don't associate with other people and other groups. So it actually can grow bigger than that. And so, um, yes, I have I have leveraged my uh, sorority experience, but again, I, I, I always want it to be positive and that I did a good job first. And then, you know, hopefully that would result in, a, you know, additional people wanting to to work with me. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Wilbur? Yeah, no, I uh, I thought about pledging an undergrad and then I uh, got scared. So uh, <laughs> that's off to Ms. Clark. Uh, they were, it was pretty tough times at Howard University back when I was there. They actually, my, my, my uh, frat got kicked off the campus. So it was tough oh. times, but um, but I will say that Ms. Clark- It's not too late. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. There's right. still time. There's grad, still grad time. chapter is there. Um, I, I will say that Ms. Clark and Ms. Sales actually uh, hit on, hit the nail on the head is, is authenticity and in, 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 in who you are as a company is key. Um, if, if you give some people preference here and others another, trust me, it will get out. And, and so the last thing you want is to, for people not to be able to trust you as a company built on integrity. And so for me, I know with our company, what we're big on is we're very focused on integrity, whether it's a, another minority small business or a very large business partner. For us, we approach every project with the same level of excellence. And for that reason, we've reaped, um, I, I believe, the rewards of being a company that businesses or, or customers can trust. Okay. What is your strategy for the continued growth and development of your business? Ms. Clark, anyone? <laughs> Ms. Sales, did you want to start this one? I can start. Oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll let you and Kelly go first. Go and steal. Yeah, right. no, I appreciate it. So, so one of the things that yeah. differentiates us as a small business is we've taken a position that um, we actually don't just willy nilly bid jobs. We have a very focused capture plan and a bid no bid strategy. Um, and we're big on building and fostering relationships with our top customers or whether it's a prime contractor or, or, um, or a client that we're interested in doing business with. Um, in the last year, we brought on a business developer that has been instrumental in knocking on the doors of those key clients and allowing us to be able to present how we can help. See, the focus for us has been, we do enough research to understand that there's a there there. 
And so when we're presenting to our potential clients, we're presenting to them from the perspective of, we know that you have some pain in this area. And this is why we are the doctor to that pain. Or this is why we are the partner to help you meet the requirements of this contract. And so for us, we don't pump out three, 400 bids a year. Um, but what we do know is we set targets and our focus is if we're gonna bid a project, we have a very either good potential relationship with, the, with whoever we're bidding to or the client, whether it's a client or the prime, if we're not the prime um, and we're a sub, you know, we, we're, we, we have that intel. And then ultimately for opportunities that are new where we don't have any relationship, our focus has been let us um, essentially focus on opportunities that are not lowest price technically acceptable because that's not the company we are. And so we've set our targets, looking at IDIQs, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts, and opportunities that allow us to prove our technical capabilities now so that when we get on these contracts, it's not a function of us trying to prove ourselves. They've already gotten that out of the way. It's a function now of us being able to have the right price for the solution. So our growth strategy, um, which has consistently been through um, networking, um, building relationships, um, again, a very focused scatter plan and bid no bid strategy. And then also execution. We have a very strong record with the customers that we've been with since we started 13 years ago of repeat business. And our focus is to continue to, to develop those relationships as we bring on new partners, new customers um, that will allow us to expand our reach over the next five years. I'm going to jump in, Ms. Clark, first, because he's, he had a lot of government language going on there, people. For all of us that know about government, if you don't, he, he threw some things out there. But um, since we're in the same type of space, we have different offerings, not just professional consulting services, um, not any kind of thing with construction. However, what I've done with the growth is to make sure that I brought in the right talent to add value to me. Because I am the business development person of the company. And as the president and CEO, you should be. And so one thing about being a leader of anything, you have to make sure that you're not willing to hide. You have to put your, your face in the place. You have to become known and you got to get out there. And, and that goes especially difficult for us. I mean, I shouldn't say difficult. We must do it because otherwise we're making it very difficult. We cannot hide, right, and, and become successful in any kind of business that you're doing. So what I've done, along with what I know I already bring to the table, is I brought people in that are senior vice president and vice president now that I've known for years, and I know that they're subject matter experts at what they do. Mm -hmm. And the three of us together now, we have a whole total dynamic business development approach that lines up with everything he said because that's the way you do government business. Yeah. Um, pipeline, all that. All that's a basic one, two, three, if you're being smart about the game. But it's your team that you bring in that supports you where you close the holes that's important for any growth for any company. Yeah. And I would just, I agree with, with what Ms. Sales and Mr. Milford both shared. I, I, I do both of those things as well. Um, one of the things I think I heard Mr. Milford say was, you know, working with having great relationships with your, your, your clients that you have now, right. And cultivating those. And I think one of the things that we try to do is we try to remember special days for, you know, our, I'm going to call premier clients, um, birthdays, anniversaries, um, the date you got your divorce, <laughs> you know, those types of celebrations are important to people. And, um, you know, across the board, customer service has really been lacking across industries. So the fact that you take the time to remember those things are important. The other thing that we started to do and we found to be very effective is we will sometimes have, you know, maybe um, breakfast at the office and we'll invite, you know, our, I'm going to call them premier clients or clients that, you know, have really been good to us in the past. Again, cultivating that relationship um, with them and continuing to remind them of how much we appreciate them. Um, we also sometimes will send them what we call a swag bag or, um, you know, a shock and awe package where it's just a box of goods, goodies, you know, it could be, you know, something that we branded a mug or a pad or a book or 
something and then you know you can depending upon how valuable that particular client was for you you can you know maybe put something really special in there right or a little bit more expensive um you know expensive pens and things like that writing pens are things that you know you want to always stay in the front of and and definitely impress them number one that you appreciate the fact that they were a customer, but that they keep sending you repeat business. So I found, you know, cultivating, you know, those good premier clients that you've had in the past and remembering them in special ways is also a good way to to continue, you know, your reputation, but also, you know, making sure that you continue keep keeping yourself, um, you know, first in their mind and first in their consideration. So let me just jump in. You know, earlier I talked about the importance of really knowing what space you're operating in. So Theo, we can't do none of that. <laughs> that be my... Don't be yeah. buying no expensive. No, no you right. cannot. Yeah. That's, what, that's what we can't do. And if they're asking for a little trouble or you're getting a name. Yes, you are. So you yeah. can, again, you have to know what industry you're going into and study it well. You do. You do. And, and, and your work, your work in, at least in the federal side, your work has to do the talking. I think every government buyer, whether it's a project manager or a contracting officer, the best best gift you could give to them is to not have them involved, literally execute on that contract with such success that all they can say is we did it and let's give you the next one, you know? Um, but no, Ms. Clark, you're, you're on point. I think in the non-federal space, that's absolutely the way um, that it's played. And um, and, and I, I do, re I think what we have to remember as well, and I'll, I'll be done here, is, is, is that um, at the end of the day, we have to recognize that even though our classification is small business, our mindset has to be large. We're not, we're not, we're not competing in a world that is, that is going to hand out because you're a small business. The question is, where was your mind? If you're thinking and operating at the same levels of your competitors that are large businesses, you're guaranteed to be on your, um, your, your, your clients' minds. Right, right, right. That's great, great comment, great comment. Okay, um, how are you building generational wealth through your company, Ms. Clark? So I don't have any children. <clears throat> However, <laughs> I do have uh, godchildren who think they're my children, right? Um, so what I do is um, I've always used them to come into the office to see how an office works, right? Um, they, in the summers, um, when they're home from college, you know, they come in, they help out. Um, so they're learning, I hope, <laughs> how to structure a business and how to grow a business. Um, so to me, it's not so much about the law as it is instilling those business virtues into them. Um, on the other part of that, you know, I do have portions of my income. Shh, they're not on here, I hope, um, that I've set aside for them. I don't want to say this too loud, right? But <laughs> <laughs> I do set aside money for them. I do have part of my practice is also estate planning. So I can't really preach estate planning, how important it is for you to have a will and or, and or a trust and powers of attorney and all of those things set up if I don't have them set up myself. So I do have, you know, several investment um, vehicles that I use for them, um, you know, when they get to a certain age or when they've reach certain milestones um or you know if for some reason i pass away that they will have some income in which to establish themselves so that is kind of how i am on my in my own way uh building generational wealth for them okay. that was one of the questions in the chat um are you doing using um internships for high school and for college students or yeah. any of you Yes. Yeah, so we, um, you know, I think that's one of the most, that, that was a great question. I, I think that's an un overlooked uh, marketing tool as well, as well as it, it brings value to the community. So last year we hired um, our, an intern from Prince George's County Public Schools. And um, I mean, she was absolutely phenomenal. And um, she was a rising senior, uh, first generation, you know, going off to college. 
and um, just came in and, and for six to eight weeks really just showcased an amazing um, just work ethic and, and desire to learn. And, and for us, it, we, we haven't won a contract with, with Prince George's County Public Schools because it wasn't about that. What it was about and what it's always been is about bringing value to the local community. And what happened as a result of her experience is that she got further clarity. Hey, I actually wanna go off to college and do electrical engineering because now I understand what electrical engineers do. And it gave her further intel insight into, into how to potentially shape her future. And so for, for, for using that as a, a kind of target, we've been focused on hiring you know, young college graduates, right? And like I said earlier, our CEO is a working president and he takes these young college graduates and engineers and brings them through when literally in four years, they are, I mean, in some have been sooner, they are at the senior level, you know, programming and managing their own projects and they've gone through the rigmarole. So our approach has been um, essentially uh, building or creating what we're looking for. Because at the end of the day, um, for us, we, we're, we're about passing it down. Uh, one of the gentlemen that used to work for us, I think even went off to start his own firm. And for us, it was like, great job. We've done our, our job by planting that seed mm -hmm. that is now flourishing with uh, what we consider. We, we don't have a, a principle in our company as competitors. It's all about partners, right? So essentially, a, it doesn't matter if you're, you're doing the same work with that client. For us, we can go further together. And so he's gone out to start his own company. And ultimately, in the future, we might support each other on, on projects. So we take that from right out of school, right out of college, and also um, looking at internships, at least one per summer. To be able to bring value to the community mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay. Can I jump in? I gotta jump in on this because we mm -hmm. use interns, um, but we have a great success story here by using the Prince George's County Workforce Development uh, Office. Uh, we have a young lady that's been with us about a year now, but she had been incarcerated for four years, and uh, they came through a program with Prince George's County and. She's been here now, just really banging it out. I mean, she just was a diamond in the rough. Uh, you know, we have worked with her. The team has worked with her, you know, to just kind of build up her character in some areas, of course, because, of course, she can't see triggers, right? Uh, uh, needless to say. But she is just a sponge, and she's doing an outstanding job. And as far as the generational wealth thing, I could take over and just not let nobody else talk. That's how adamant I am about it. Uh, but I just recently obtain a complex trust, and like Ms. Clark, I don't have kids, but I can now bless 15 generations beyond it. So it's just about mm -hmm. actually the, the best man when he show up, you know what I'm saying? If he got some kids, he, he got the holy hookup going on because I can bless the children's children. And beyond the fact of getting a complex trust, it's, it is about investing and making sure that money uh, has some compound interest on it. But I really want to just talk about the importance of us as a people and how we need to work with each other. You know, right now mm -hmm. it's a building management solutions. I tell my team, you know, I need you to get me three quotes. I would like for you to find three African-American companies that are offering this service and get me some quotes. And it's not to eliminate people, but it's the fact to include people because we are not, when I gave those numbers earlier, is because we are not as a people supporting each other in business. And I find that, you know, that being consistent because we have been brainwashed to think that we're not good at what we do. I'm not going to that store. I'm not shopping with those people. I'm not going to, they're always late, you know, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's really just excuses uh, that we have consistently leaned in on. And we have to do better uh, as a people because we can't give that to any other community. The reason why they are doing well with their own communities is because they do shop and buy with each other. And as a people, I know that that's an area that we must strengthen in order to create generational wealth across the board for the African-American community. OK, um, well, I think you all have answered this last question. Um, how do you see your business investing in the Black community? So I'm going to combine it with another um, chat question. The qu chat question is, um, uh, how has the history of black, uh, black entrepreneurship influenced your mission? Uh, I'm sorry. How has the history of black entrepreneurship influenced your mission as a business owner? Yeah. If, um, if no, I, I think, um, you know, one, one of the things or 
that I like to mention about our president was he came from West Africa to, to America. And essentially he has now experienced and built for himself and his family, the American dream, right? And that stemmed from, again, uh, uh, growing up in a household where he saw the work ethic of his mom just supersede the work ethic of anybody else. And so his whole vision was, I want to take that burden off of her shoulder. And one of the ways that he knew he could do that was to duplicate himself. And that's why he started our company, right? And so I think um, as, as he looks back now, and as we even consider the company that, that he's been able to build, it is built on the backs of persevering through adversity. Because there are many times when, um, when we didn't have 18 employees and, and it was just him and a couple other people that people would say, hey, you're not big enough to be able to take this contract. But recognizing that others in the past were able to succeed with even less of circumstances um, promoted and pushed him to pursue and to give it his all regardless of the test, so much so now that um, we're competing with companies that are 100 times our size and still winning contracts, right? And so I think the important factor is to recognize again that no matter what anybody else says, what is here is something they can't take. And what we need to do is to leverage our history, but also leverage our knowledge and share and, and collaborate, as Ms. Sales said, and, 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 and unite not just with Blacks or Whites, but as a people in the small business arena for the success of every single group. I think we can do more together and that's what he has proven. And as we've taken on that partnership approach, um, essentially, hey, I see an opportunity and, and, and we use the rule of two in federal contracting. And I set it out to another colleague, why? Because we know if two small businesses reply to this bid, it's likely that we can stare it our way. And so if, he, if they win or we win, we now can go at this together using that leverage and that mentality of saying, hey, we can actually work together for the good of all. Is, is allowing us to, to grow and um, allow us to be successful. Anyone want to comment? It was interesting to me with the first panel, there was three small business owners in startup and they were all from a family of entrepreneurs, which I found interesting, you know, it, it was, now, I don't have the entrepreneurs in my family. We all work. <laughs> we work hard, <laughs> but um, we don't have that entrepreneur um, experience. So, okay. Um, I think we've finished our questions. If anyone else has anything to add, okay. Um, I want to thank you all um, for your comments. It looks like Dr. Rosado has her hand up. Um, okay, I can't see her here. Um, Dr. Rosado? Okay. Yes, I just I just wanted, I was just very interested in, in the in the response to the, the, the question in the chat because I don't I don't think many people realize which the, question? Which question? The question I put in the chat, I don't think many people realize the extent of black entrepreneurship historically in America. And I think uh, we've heard about Tulsa, we've heard about uh, Greenwood, and there are so many other smaller cities that were developed by African Americans moving out, as I learned last night uh, in the Ida B. Wells film, moving out of places like Memphis, Tennessee, and they're the ones that settled in the Oklahoma territories further into all the way into California. But the level and degree of entrepreneurship among black Americans has been absolutely phenomenal. And I don't think it's, it's spoken about enough. I don't think it's realized. I don't think um, we even, like we know about Robert Smith, I mean, when do we learn about Robert Smith? Most of us learn, unfortunately, when he paid the, um, the um, bills for his graduating class. I mean, why didn't we know about him before? You know, Reginald Lewis. I mean, we have a history and a tradition that I think um, 
we always need to include and project and move forward. So people don't think this is a one-off. You all are phenomenal. And I'm so honored to have listened to all of you today. Mm -hmm. However, you're, you're just moving forward in a tradition that has long existed. Hats off to you, all of you, each of you. Absolutely. This is, is Lori. I'd like to speak to that a little bit. And I'm totally in agreement with uh, Dr. Lois. And, but the reality and the unfortunate reality is that we're not given that, right? We're not given that at all. Again, you know, I, I, I say it on panels. I'm not afraid to say it here with this group. I've been an entrepreneur all my life, legal and illegal. I'm from the streets of Chicago, literally. Uh, I grew up in a project right down the street, excuse me, right down the street from Ida B. Wells. Uh, uh, which we had a project complex called that. And my journey was to getting out of Chicago to escape from the madness of what I had got myself in being a, a city girl was to join the military. And it, of course, did enhance my life. It changed my life. But after I got out, some things returned as it had before. Uh, I escaped ever being incarcerated myself. Uh, um, but nonetheless, the difference between that is somebody that got caught and somebody that didn't get caught. But it's those same skills, it's that same uh, a persona that I have when I walk into a room to the point where people can kind of say I'm about my business that I had when I was on the streets of Chicago. So mm -hmm. it's a matter of wherever your journey starts. And I didn't come from a family entrepreneur. My mother cleaned houses in the Jewish community. My dad was a hat locker. We grew up low income. So I, I did have both parents. I was really grateful for that. But it's been my own determination based off of what I've learned, Dr. Lewis, that me being Black is not my disadvantage. Right. Very good. It's not my disadvantage. <laughs> Very good. What I got to do is get it together, you know what I mean, and get my mind right. Like but what Theo was talking about, I'm all about my mind. Get my mind right, check my mind, check my thoughts, think about what I'm thinking about from moment to moment. Screw that day-to-day -day thing. From moment to moment, I got to check my thoughts so that I can stay on top of my game in representing myself as an African-American woman that's in business. And yeah. make sure that I lead the way to show us how we can do it and how we can do it with, with great grace, uh, uh, intelligence, as well as wisdom. And yeah. that wisdom is coming from what Dr. Lewis is talking about. There's wisdom in all of these people that have done great things that nobody knows about in our community unless you go digging in some files. <laughs> you, know, you can't trust all the movies, but digging into some files and reading books uh, that will give you some education and say, if they did it, I can do it too. Right. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think also, if I could add, I think, you know, we come from really strong stock, right? And if we look at, you know, our ancestors and how they came here and what they fought through and the accomplishments that we've made as of 2020, are we there? No. <laughs> I mean, 2022. <laughs> are we there? No. But man, I mean, just the fact that we've survived so many things and still have thrived in the ways that we have. I think is amazing. And so there's always an example. It doesn't have to, for me, it doesn't have to be an attorney. It just has to be someone that was successful. And I think also we kind of innately feel a responsibility to uh, not only be average, but better than average. Because, you know, I want a young lady that's in high school or in college that is thinking about being an attorney to be able to look to me as an example. So that's one way. And then on the on a lateral way, you know, when I sit down and come up with a business plan or a business idea, I'm not afraid to share that with others. So, you know, I, I'm always preaching about don't just be an attorney, be a business person first. And here's what I've learned. Don't make the mistakes I made, right? Here's what you, how you can do um, what I'm doing with less effort because I've already done it. So here's a blueprint, take this and run with it. So I think it's lateral. It's you also looking back, but also looking forward as well. And I've learned so much from Miss Sales. <laughs> I'm taking notes. I said, oh, she does a boot camp. Okay, check. You know, and you know, Mr. Milford talked about, you know, his lines of credit, all great things. So 
that I'm all, of course interested in, right? And that hopefully we all will continue to work together as we move forward. Yeah, well, I'll just add it's it's so, and both ladies have, have been on point. Uh, and Dr. Sato, thanks again for this opportunity for us to communicate together. Um, I, I think the key is never forget our why. why. Why are we in business? Why are we here? Where did we come from and where are we going? I think if, we, if that is clear in our minds and, and our mission and our vision is clear, I think we will absolutely continue the legacy that many before us have born and died for not being able to see. But we now have the opportunity to carry that baton across, pass it on to the next generation with the hopes of establishing a stronger framework, even yet a better future for those coming be, be, um, behind us. And so I think it's so important for us to collectively have these conversations because as, as Ms. Clark just said, I'm taking notes myself thinking about all right, how do we put into place even more um, opportunities to have these conversations that help the juices to be flowing so that collectively we can all um, go further together. Mr. Wilf Mil Milford, thank you so much. That was a great, great um, summary inspiration rap it was that was perfect <laughs> that's perfect so thank you it was just give us not only our thoughts and but gave us really gave us a direction forward to continue the conversation and we hopefully we can find the means to do that i'm yeah, going to bring in waving their hand oh i can't see everyone well you need to Irwin. your view at the top put it on gallery Leanne. Leanne. yeah i can't see. it it jumps yes um Hi folks, my name is Lee. Oh, Ms. Erwin, okay. Um, and I uh, want to thank you. I'm co-chair of the Greenbelt Black History and Culture Committee. And um, first on a light note, here we are in Prince George's County. When are we gonna have some jazz music venue? We need it. Come on folks, let's get going. That's one thing. Um, and I think that um, we, are, we wanna build community and cooperation. So thank you. I think you know, we live in a competitive consumer society. And so we are taking any opportunity we can to build community. So thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. And for you all, and for, for those of us watching and for you as colleagues, you know, this is, we need to make time for community. So thank you for doing that. The third thing is that class issues play, you know, I'm, a, I'm European American maybe it's a little more clear class issues, but class issues are also part of the African-American community, the, the American community. And certainly we know we live in a very rich community for African-Americans in the United States. Um, so, but it's very complex class issues. So any comments about, about that? Thank you. No, um, very good point. Um, and I think it's clear, right? We, we do live, Prince George's County, I think the last time I read is one of the most affluent um, black counties, I believe in the country. Um, and, and, but that within Prince George's County of itself has pockets, right? Um, I mean, there you drive on one side of, of, of Greenbelt and it's, it's completely opposite to the other side. And so the reality is, yes, um, I think uh, Ms. Sales made a good part, uh, a good point earlier, which is one of the things that as businesses, we have to wrap our minds around is how can we bring even those who are not necessarily checking every box in our, in our resume, you know, requirements or background check requirements back into the workforce so that we can begin to change their 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 reality their experience and bring them closer to where we have grown to be right my sales came from chicago i originally um my president came from west africa ultimately none of us started out in wealth but we all have taken a position to build to where we are today and i believe it's incumbent upon us to not leave the brothers and sisters who don't have that same work ethic behind we can help them by, by bringing them in, giving them opportunity. And, and sometimes it won't work. I mean, I, I'll be the first to tell you, I've made some hiring decisions that I regret, you know, um, but at the same time, I also look at it as an opportunity to have shown them that there's another way. And even though it didn't work out this time, maybe just maybe we gave them an opportunity that 
the light bulb will go off the next opportunity they get so that it does provide um, that their response in that situation or scenario will be different. So I do believe that we, we certainly have to you know, acknowledge that there is classism even within our own community, but nonetheless, it is incumbent upon us to, to not allow that to be the deciding factor between who we hire, who we don't hire. There are people on both sides of the classes that still bring value. And it's important for us as small businesses to go out there and find those people, give them the opportunity and know that when we're giving them that opportunity, we're beginning to change the people that are in their class as well. Before we continue, I wanna get Ms. Liggins in here. Um, she's our fourth panelist. She's an uh, Greenbelt Government Economic Development Coordinator, Growth and Sustainability Resources. So Cherise, do you have any comments to add? Any information to add? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, on behalf of the city of Greenbelt, I wanna thank you all for such a great conversation. I'm just like eating it up. I'm, in, I'm both inspired, I'm motivated. I'm, I can't wait to, um, you know, reconnect with all of you and, you know, definitely think about further ways to not only support and spread the word of what you all do, but, um, you know, just continue to, to be a resource to you all. And so thank you again on um, behalf of the city for sharing uh, so much wisdom. I am so excited to, uh, to be able to share this once the recording is up uh, because you dropped so many gems, as the young people say, <laughs> um, that I think think any business really would uh, be so appreciative to hear. And so thank you for that. I am just going to be really brief. Um, I just want to share um, what the city of Greenbelt does to support our existing businesses. And then um, I'm just going to show a screen um, of resources that many of you have already mentioned uh, to, to really support um, your business, different resources and different networks to tap into. So just gonna share my screen really quickly. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So, at a very local level, um, my role is really to be a liaison to the business community. And so, you know, that really looks like, you know, sort of this idea of one on one technical assistance, getting to know uh, your business and, and really learning more about what you do and how, how I can be of assistance and how the city can be of assistance to you. Um, we offer business networking events. Um, Lori knows them quite well. <laughs> um, and we also have a monthly business newsletter that we send out, you know, with different information, different grant opportunities, and other resources that might be helpful for businesses. And we do business spotlights. We haven't really done a lot lately just because of COVID, but um, you know, any opportunity that we can share any news about your business, any other opportunities, you know, we are kind of here to, to, to make sure that people know who you are, that you exist. And so I definitely recommend any business to take uh, advantage of um, being spotlighted. You know, sometimes we do videos, sometimes we do write-ups, but uh, we like to, to share locally what's happening with our businesses. And then lastly, and by the way, if anyone is interested in getting a copy of this list, I am more than happy to share that information. But here are different resources that um, businesses that are sort of certainly in the growth phase that are really looking to sort of build that uh, intergenerational wealth can tap into um, in the county and then certainly across the state and federal government. And so I know I, I will not read all of them, but I know Lori mentioned Employee Prince George's, which is a great resource for employers and uh, potential job seekers to get access to training um, and other, other job related resources. Um, we have Maryland Women's Business Center, the Small Business Administration, 
Um, they have, you know, different loan programs and, and, a, and a variety of resources that are offered through the federal government. Um, and then there are, are resources like technical assistance um, from entrepreneurs, seasoned entrepreneurs. So uh, definitely use resources like SCORE, which is listed here. Um, but again, these are just some of the many resources that um, businesses can kind of tap into um, locally, um, as well as across the state uh, and federally uh, to support continued business growth and sustainability. And so, just wanted to share those. I will include my email in the chat as well. But uh, again, just so excited about this conversation and uh, just thank you again. This is this is really great. I'm just so inspired. <laughs> I can't say that enough. <laughs> Has the wheel spinning, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, well, does anyone else have any comments or? I think we're going to wrap it up. I will say thank you. Thank you to the entire committee um, on behalf of all of us. Uh, you You're oh. muted. Did right. you just no. muted? Just you. Sorry. No, I just wanted to thank the entire uh, Greenbelt team, you know, uh, Dr. Rosado, uh, Ms. Leggins, uh, Ms. Gale. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to just bring us all together, having this conversation. I think this absolutely changes the game. For us as small businesses when we can come together um now i'll go and 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 hopefully be able to to find out more about how we can we can continue the conversation even beyond this 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 opportunity so certainly appreciate it thank you so much to our team thank you thank you all thank you thank you, you, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. by the way theo just get in touch with sharice she'll set up anything you want <laughs> yeah, Sharice has been great. Sharice, I've been very resourceful. Yes, she is. Yeah, she's the reason why we're here. So we appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sharice. And all my right. co chair, Leanne. Good night, everyone. Thank, thank, you, thank, you. thank you all. You all were wonderful. You all were wonderful. Very informative. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much, Ms. King. Thank Ms. King. King, thank you for being thank here. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.